These are three names at the very center of Ghana's education history. James Avery, a native of Anomabo, and the first vice principal of Achimota College. Alexander Fraser, the first principal of Achimota College. And Gordon Gadgester, arguably the best governor in the history of colonial Ghana and the founder of Achimota College and Kolebu Teaching Hospital. Kindred spirits, they so admired each other that Agri named his youngest son after Gajisa. My theme for this year's memorial lectures is in Kruma and the making of the Ghanaian nation state. I chose this theme with two lectures that speak to the political economy of Ghana from the 1950s through the 1970s. Because Africa's developmental challenges have not changed since independence. We are still exporters of raw materials. African countries trade more with the West and with Asia than they do amongst themselves. On a per capita basis, African farmers produce less today than they did at the end of colonial rule. Industrialization remains elusive, yet historically no country has developed without a strong manufacturing sector. I am drawn to the first generation of independent African leaders because they were a remarkable group of individuals when they settled though along the way some may have lost direction. They include Prophet Boanya, Sekuture, Leopold Sengo, Julius Nyerere, Kenneth Kaunda, and my subject for today, Kwame Nkrumah, and many others. They wanted to change their countries, Africa and the image of Africa around the world. They were born, formed, and pursued political careers in what has been called the American century, a 20th century with the European colonial powers in decline, resulting in decolonization. The rise of two new superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, and the birth in the mid 20th century of a number of new institutions, often with the United States in the lead, the United Nations, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund that today exercise global hegemonic influence. The first generation of Africa's leaders had bold ambitions to transform their nation. Ambitions that today may even appear chaotic. But they were not alone in their optimism. The 1974 Nobel laureate in economics, Gona Murdo, wrote in his book, Asian Drama, An Inquiry into the Poverty of Nations, that Africa's growth prospects will be superior to those of Asia. Today we know that the story has been different. I draw on a set of new sources for an African story that underscore how the United States has become central to the study of Africa from the mid 20th century. The World Bank's archives, the John F. Kennedy Library and archives, the Hershey archives in Pennsylvania, they are the ones who make our chocolates, released CIA records and others. I have also been conducting several interviews with senior Ghanaian citizens whose active careers date back to the early years of independence. Individuals like Kebi Asante, Kwame Jehucha, Kentika, Dr. Kwame Dongo Fodro, Dr. Joseph Abe, Dr. Kwesi Boche, Dr. Kwabna Dufo, Commander Kwabna and many others. These sources bring new insights to my understanding of Ghana's early decades of independence that I would like to share with you today and tomorrow.
If I were to characterize today's lecture, I would call it more academic history. Tomorrow, I will do more of people's history. Because when we come to the 70s, we don't have as many records, especially on the NRC. So I'll be done primarily dependent on oral interviews. Today's lecture is on Nkrumah, Koko, and the United States, the vision of an industrial nation state. In this, I explore Nkrumah's determination to build an industrial nation state with the Apple support down as the engine of economic transformation with funds provided by Coco and the place of the United States in Nkrumah's plans. Scholars have often compared the economies of Ghana and Ivory Coast. Both have a common geography, share some ethnic groups like the Aka, constitute the two leading producers of Coco in the world, and have radically different political ideologies in the first decade of independence. I will provide comparative insights from Côte d'Ivoire in today's lecture. Tomorrow, I will examine African socialism in Ghana in the 1960s and 70s, and to explore if this was a search for an indigenous model of economic development. Placing Ghana's socialist experiment within the context of similar experiments across the continent has been richly instructive for together they underscore common objectives in African socialism, particularly the desire for self-reliance. I'm writing a book on early independence, which ends around 1980. But of my four case studies, Nkrumah, Sekuturi, Sengo, and Inyerere, Nkrumah was the first to fall from power in 1966 putting a wrinkle in my chronology since the book is supposed to go to 1980. Until several senior Ghanaians I interviewed pointed to how the National Redemption Council under General Ignatius Kutue Champo was in some ways a successor to the CPP government. Indeed, from my sources, Nkrumah assumed that those who staged the coup in 1972 were his people, and he would be invited back as head of state. That this did not happen was deeply disappointing to him. He would die later that year. And I have found interesting continuities that makes it worth just opposing the CPP and the NRC in tomorrow's lecture. Tomorrow's lecture will be short, 30 minutes, because of the, the special congregation. Today I have permission from the Vice Chancellor to keep you as long as I want. <laughs> I dedicate today's lecture and tomorrow's lecture to KV Asante and to Kwame Jeruche, who I interviewed extensively in July last year, and both have since passed. So, today's lecture, Nkrumah, Coco and the United States, the vision of an industrial African nation state. I have put the outline so that you can, my lecture will be accompanied by the PowerPoint. That way I don't lose you in the delivery of the lecture. So this is a, a, a paper in five parts. There's an introduction and a conclusion. And I'll read both to make sure that we both leave on the, we all leave on the same page. Because the substance of the argument and where we go from here are outlined in the introduction and the conclusion. Then I will speak about Coco and rural revolution in the Gold Coast. And since we all know about the history of Coco, during that section I will not read. What I'll do is that I'll put a number of images and speak through photographs to the history of Coco. And then I'll look at Nkrumah in the US because there's a sense in which Nkrumah's time in the US shaped his formation. And so we cannot talk about Kwame Nkrumah and leave that period from 1935 through 1945. Then I'll look at development, economics, modernization theory, 
and the state in Africa. And there I'll look at the Apostle Mudam and this place in Ghana's vision of industrialization. In the conclusion, I call it failed dreams, but it depends on your perspective. Because we have declining cocoa and we have no industry. And then we'll see where we go from there. So that's the agenda for the day. So my introduction, independence and the modernist dream. On March 6, 1957, as we all know, Ghana became independent and the Parliament Women's Convention CPP. Strikingly, Ivory Coast Prophet Waiye did not attend Ghana's independence ceremonies. The following month, Kwame Nkrumah passed through Abidjan on April 5th on his way to Conakry to visit Sekutui. Prophet gave Nkrumah a tour of Abidjan, a city that had undergone significant physical transformation since World War II through funds provided by the French government's Investment Fund for Economic and Social Development, or FIDES. Through FIDES, roads, bridges, railways, canals, and airports in Abidjan Harbor had been constructed mostly through grants made possible by the Marshall Plan given to the European countries for reconstruction. Prophet took in Roma to see the new Abidjan port, and they drove along the canal that connected the port to the sea. To and found irritating the independence speeches of Nkrumah the previous month. He asked Nkrumah after showing Nkrumah Abidjan how Africa could develop without the general support of the metropole. Nkrumah found Mufet's Wayne's cozy relationship with the French colonial power very problematic. For Nkrumah, freedom and African independence could not be compromised. For Ghana to have such a relationship with Britain would be the very essence of new colonialism that he would write about in 1965. Somehow the two made a bet or a wager there and then to see whose country will experience more social and economic development in 10 years' time. The following day, their bets became public, when their disagreement showed up in their speeches before the Ivorian Assembly. This became the famous West African wager, the outcome of which John Warrenoff wrote about in 1972. I have these on the slide, but unfortunately you cannot see them, so that's uh, unfortunately. Writing in 1972, when the Ivorian miracle was in full bloom, Warnock declared Ivory Coast the winner. Both Nkrumah and Rufet were pursuing the modernist dream, but through very different strategies. African independence came with huge socioeconomic expectations from societies emerging from colonialism. African nationalist leaders were eager to prove to the world that they were capable of governing themselves in the new nations and creating prosperous economies. The early decades of independence overlapped with modernization theory and its teleological narrative of progress for the new nation states through industrialization, urbanization, and modernization. Two critical ingredients to make this dream possible were capital and technology, both of which could be attracted from outside. Modernization theory had emerged in post-World War II United States in the context of the Cold War and newly independent nations in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. Modernization and the resultant prosperity the United States believed would serve as a bulwark against communism. This was also the era of development economics, which had emerged in the post-World War II era of European reconstruction. And here Europe was thinking of how it could use the tropical economies in the rebuilding of Europe. Development economics was referred to originally as colonial economics, 
with a focus on growing tropical economies. It was a beneficiary of two important influences that would be instrumental in the African context. First, the idea of fiscal deficits as necessary, especially in infrastructure, that aided productivity if it positioned you for economic growth. So it was good to borrow money if you used it for productive purposes. In a sense, it was a good debt. This was an inside gain from Keynes during the Great Depression, when the state created employment for people so that money could be in people's pockets to stimulate consumption in the market. The second was the role of the state in economic planning and the state as an economic actor, which is another insight from Keynes, but a phenomenon that came to be typified by Soviet economic planning. So the new leaders of the African nation states turned to development economies as advisors, sought the necessary foreign capital and technology, and set off confidently to create new industrialized nation states. Nkrumah in invited the West Indian economist, William Arthur Lewis, from Manchester University to become his chief economic advisor. For the Ivory Coast, technical expertise for economic development came from the soil and the social scientists at the Office for Overseas Scientific and Technical Research. This was an era of big state projects, hydroelectric dams, mechanized and irrigated agricultural schemes, and state-owned enterprises. The colonial state, in its own way, was a developmental state. Though its plans for development were always to the benefit of the metropole. As early as the 1910s and the 1920s, the British colonial government in the Gold Coast had surveyed the Volta River and proposed future dams at Ajena, which is close to Akosombo, a second at Pong, and a third at Bui. We've built all three. Those were colonial plans. The first dam to be built at Ajena, which is closest to Pong, would provide electricity to power an aluminum smelter and process bauxite mined in Ghana. Again, this is the colonial plan. Nkrumah would assume the colonial government's developmental agenda, but turn it to serve the new nation of Ghana and his modernist aspirations. When it became obvious with decolonization that Britain was no longer interested in funding the development projects that had championed, Nkrumah turned to the United States in search of development funds. Nkrumah had been educated in the US between 1935 and 1945, where he pursued undergraduate education at Lincoln and graduate study at the University of Pennsylvania. Nkrumah's most formative period had been this 10 years in the United States. Pennsylvania would be at the center of Nkrumah's visit to the U.S. in 1951 to receive an honorary doctorate from Lincoln, and again in 1958. And the state housed not just Lincoln and the University of Pennsylvania, but also importantly, Hershey Corporation the makers of chocolate. Through the intervention of President John F. Kennedy, Nkrumah secured the American funding that made the Apostle Buddha and the Volta Aluminium Company, or Balco, possible. Nkrumah had big plans for Ghana's economic transformation, largely to be financed from Ghana's cocoa exports. The British during World War II had created marketing boards in Ghana and in Nigeria to stabilize the prices for cocoa. The idea is that we'll pay you a little less than the world market price, we'll put it in a fund, so that when the world price drops, we will draw from the fund to stabilize the price we pay for you, so that you always receive a constant price for your cocoa. 
The challenge is that between 1939 and 1958, well, cocoa prices rose steadily, and the stabilization fund accumulated a large surplus. The colonial government and its successor African governments came to view the cocoa fund as a development fund for the economy. While Nkrumah appreciated the cash cow that was cocoa, he was ambivalent about its pre-modern infrastructure and the dominance of small family farms, which he considered inadequate as a driving force for his industrialization schemes. The average acreage of cocoa farms in Ghana was six acres. This did not lend themselves to the mechanized agriculture in Krumah and this age. Commander Ban will put it, Commander Ado will put it this way. He called it handkerchief farm. Somebody will have two acres here, one acre there, with forest in between. In Krumah's policies and the cut the cocoa industry, though the results would not be evident until the 1970s, as Ghana declined as the world's leading producer of cocoa, and the Ivory Coast emerged as the premier producer of cocoa. Nkrumah's state-led industrialization scheme, premised on electricity supplied by the Akosomoda, was not successful either, leaving Ghana handicapped in both its agricultural and industrial sectors. The major beneficiary of Ghana's new source of electricity was Valco, 90% owned by Kaiser Aluminum in the United States, which secured electricity at heavily discounted rates for 30 years to smelt imported aluminum, not the local bauxite, as the colonial government and Nkoma had hoped for. So the next section is on cocoa and the rural revolution in the Gold Coast. And since this is a familiar story, if we could switch to the slides, I will show you images and then just speak to the story. In 1911, the Gold, Gold Coast farmers and traders were looking for a replacement. And this is when Tetequashi would bring cocoa, as we all know from Fernando Po to Accra as a carpenter who had gone to work there. He would go to the green range and experiment with cocoa there. But in addition to Tetequashi, the Basel mission had a botanical gardens at the green, it's still the green botanical garden. And they experimented with crops like cocoa and coffee and other things. And then they would encourage African or Gold Coast farmers to adapt these new cash crops. So Coco came through two avenues, Tetequashi and the Basel Mission Botanical Garden. But I think as Ghanaians, we like nationalist stuff, so I like the Tetequashi story better. <laughs> Coco Tetequashi noted, grew in forested regions in Fernando Po. So clearly you cannot grow Coco in Accra which is why he went to the Kyapin Ridge. But the Kyapin Ridge is also mountainous. So the territories that one could grow cocoa was limited. So after a few years, the Kyapin farmers, this is Tetequashi's farm, it's still there, with some of the old trees from the late 19th century. So it's a tourist attraction, and if you haven't been there, you should go and visit Tetequashi. This is a map. So we will see that a Kyapin and the Kyapin Mampo is where cocoa begins. They run out of space and the Kyapin farmers come down and they go east to Achima Buakwa. And Achima Buakwa will become the center of cocoa cultivation through the 1930s. By the time we come to the 1930s, Achima Buakwa is, or that area of Achima Buakwa is producing almost half the tonnage of cocoa exported from the Gold Coast. The Gold, the Ukrapin farmers would be joined by Krobo farmers. Krobo farmers were the leading farmers in Panama. 
Now there was no palm oil. They were also looking for exports. So they would migrate to east, the eastern region or to Achimabuapa and join the Ukrapin farmers. It is these two farmers working from the Achimabuapa area that made Gold Coast the number one producer of cocoa in 1980. In the 1920s, cocoa went to Ashanti. By the time we get to the 1940s, Ashanti had become the Gold Coast's leading producer. In those days, Ashanti and Bronga Hafo were together. So Ashanti and Bronga Hafo were the leading producers of cocoa. In the 40s, cocoa will move to the western region and to Cote d'Ivoire. So Cote d'Ivoire, in terms of cocoa, is a very, very small brand. And we will see how they will come up. That cocoa became important in Asante in the 40s and the 50s will play an important role in Ghana's politics. Because cocoa has an important revenue for the government's fund. Would mean that from, you know, for the Asante, the number of Asante, it meant that our money was developing the nation. This would feed into sentiments that would lead into the formation of the National Liberation Movement in 1945. And it would pose a against Ashanti. And cocoa policies almost came to reflect this antagonism between Nkoma and Ashanti. Let me show you some images about what cocoa looked like in the colonial period, if we can go to our slides again. So cocoa, as I've said, was mostly done by family farms with family labor. So here you see a mother, children, breaking their cocoa pots. Here you see them drying their cocoa. You see women head loading cocoa to go to the depot to sell. And cocoa farmers will create cooperatives and they will make their own feeder roads because the railway had been built from 1898. The railway went from Sekendi first to Kumasi because the British wanted to be able to take soldiers quickly to Kumasi because the Asante from the 19th century always fought with the British. And then it will extend from secondly westward to tap into the mines, to Sia, Tapa, and the rest. And then it will go eastward just to Accra because we have to connect the capital city. And then it will connect from Accra to Kumasi. And that was our triangular grid for cocoa. Rural cocoa farmers, to show how entrepreneurial they were, created cooperatives and on their own would make feeder roads to connect the Afriko village to a railway point so that they could bring their cocoa to be fed. In the process, they will make their own makeshift bridges. And here I'm using the Basel Mission Archive. So these are people. Now they've made their own bridge across a river. They put their cocoa in a cask and they roll the cocoa along it. There is a sense in which, in 1960, Robert Zeruzewski will write an important study of the economy of Ghana. He would argue that between 1890 and 1911, the Ghanaian economy went through important structural transformation. And with that, we saw the rise of cocoa. But he continued that from 1911 to 1960, the Ghanaian economy did not change. It remained stagnant. And this was the picture and the structure of the cocoa industry. It is this that Nkrumah found problematic. It is desire to create a modern nation state and an industrial state. It is this that he sought to change. 